Our next speaker is going to be Dr. David Toledo. Dr. T Toledo is a rangeland specialist with the USDA ARS Center in Mandan. His research focuses on ecosystem health evaluation, the human dimensions of rangeland management, and finding ways of optimizing land management practices under changing climate and land use scenarios. David's work has resulted in improvements in rangeland sampling techniques used in the NRI data set, in the integration of pasture land and rangeland monitoring and assessment methods, and in determining the social ecological factors affecting the use of prescribed fire in Texas and North Dakota. David also has done a lot of work, not only in the US, but also in Mexico, Peru, Chile, Colombia, and Kazakhstan. Uh, Dr. Lito's title today is Landowner Perceptions of an inv Invasive Grass in the Northern Plains of the US. Let's welcome David. Thank you, and thank you very much to the organizers for putting together such a great program and for accepting my talk Friday. And so thank you very much for this last minute inclusion. So I'm gonna talk about research that Kayandra Rajala did as part of her master's thesis. She was at Virginia Tech under Mike Cerise. And together we kind of designed this experiment because we wanted to learn more about what was happening with Kentucky bluegrass and landowner perceptions of, of Kentucky bluegrass and whether they were interested in managing for it or not. Um, John earlier mentioned that I was gonna talk about fire. Uh, this talk is not gonna be about fire. Sorry, John. <laughs> But, but uh, I look up to John, I want to keep him happy. So, so I'll give you a, a, a quick recap. So uh, Kayla Bendel, who was a master's student here at, at NDSU, uh, she was working with Tori Hovick. She did work on perceptions of fire here in North Dakota. We put together a survey. And one of the interesting things she found was that, uh, as opposed to what we originally thought, not everyone in North Dakota is opposed to fire. So there is some willingness to burn, but there's some major barriers to getting those burns done. And those burns had to do with a lack of, of knowledge, a, a access to resources, and those resources mainly included a, a labor during burning days and equipment. And we proposed that the creation of prescribed burn associations would be a really a, a good step forward towards a, reducing those barriers. Summary of that talk. So now on to this one. So, as we've heard, uh, there's been plenty of, of research that shows Kentucky bluegrass has increased. Uh, national resource inventory data show that it's invaded more than 50% of the acres sampled in, in both of the Dakotas. So we've heard, we've actually seen this graph too, how that invasion uh, kind of, uh, like we, we start getting those homogenized ecosystems. We start losing a lot of those ecosystem services that these grasslands provide. And uh, as, as Kentucky bluegrass starts invading, the, the perception is not that negative. We, we, we see that, that we still have a, lots of forage for our animals. There's still habitat. Everything is okay at those lower levels of invasion. This is a C3 species, as I think we all know. Uh, but then as, as, your, as land gets more invaded with Kentucky bluegrass, and you get hit by a drought or, or really high temperatures, those perceptions start to change and people, start, they realize that they have nothing to feed their animals because now all you have is that C3 species, not a lot of diversity. So if you actually reduce the length of your grazing season. So it is a big problem. And remember this as we kind of go through the, through the data on the human dimensions because it, it will matter that level of invasion. And Cami showed too that, that in terms of management, that level of invasion matters. One important thing is that even though we uh, talk about burning and different management practices, once we start getting that invasion of bluegrass, not everyone is going to be willing to apply different management treatments. And, and there's different ecological, social, economic factors of, of either managing or not managing these areas. And those all have to be taken into account when you, when you kind of propose different treatments to landowners. If, and in particular, if I prescribe fire, big social barriers if, in terms of, of what I spoke earlier about some of those, those barriers to adoption of, of fire. So in 2018, we designed this survey to look at the at, at different acceptability and management intentions of, of uh, towards uh, kind of management of an invasive grass in North Dakota. So and we talk about invasive grass, not just Kentucky bluegrass or smooth brome, even though those are two important grasses, we wanted to broaden it to any invasive species. 
uh, to just kind of get a, a broad uh, view of, of what of invasive species in general and see how that accept, uh, acceptability of an invasive grass would affect those management intentions. So our, our objective was to understand how changes in ecosystem services relate to landowners' acceptance of and management intentions for invasive grasses. Again, invasive grasses in general, not just Kentucky bluegrass, not just smooth brome, but we did have questions embedded within the survey about Kentucky bluegrass mainly. And, and we'll go over the results of that in a bit. So what we did uh, was create a transit across North Dakota. We sampled nine different counties. Each of these uh, nine counties, we try to send 142 different surveys uh, to, to, to landowners who had a thousand acres or more of land. And this was a survey that we sent out, about 10 pages, 40 something questions. If you were one of those landowners who responded to that survey, thank you very much. And so our, our actual uh, sampling frame was, uh, it was about, uh, it was 1,278, I believe, uh, uh, total mail surveys that got sent out. Uh, and we got a response of about 509 surveys, uh, which was fairly decent, but not as great as, as we would have wanted to. Actually, sample size, 1,219. So I said 278, but there were surveys uh, address had changed, uh, people had moved, uh, things like that. So some of those surveys weren't, weren't deliverable. So our, our effective sample size ended up being 1,219. So what we did was we did a vignette factorial survey experiment, which was embedded within the survey. So the survey in general was asking about those, those management intentions and, and acceptability of the grass. But we did this little experiment where we had a vignettes that varied in level of, of acceptability of, of these different phenomena. And the phenomena that we were interested were these seven ecosystem services. And, and we varied the level at which these seven different ecosystem services affected uh, their grassland. So this is just an example of one of the vignettes. We had four different, uh, or we had several different vignettes, but, but landowners in one survey only answered to four of these different examples. So there were several different versions of the survey that got mailed out to, to each land or to different landowners. So in, in, in this vignette, we talk about new grass species expanding onto your native rangelands. And based on current scientific research and best available information from other landowners, uh, you know that once this grass establishes and then you go into the different ecosystem services and, and kind of gauge that and I'll show you in a little bit the, what the different ecosystem services were and the level of variability in that. So uh, we already saw. So for each vignette, the landowners were asked to, to rate the acceptability of that invasive uh, uh, grass on their land. And then whether they intended to manage, they would intend to manage that, that invasive based on that level of acceptability. So the seven ecosystem services that we, we looked at were forage availability, forage quality, forage quantity, floral resources, water availability, grassland bird diversity, and grass diversity. All of them have three different levels of variation from a kind of normal, less than normal, and, and, and above, except for forage availability, which just had spring, summer, and, and late summer forage availability. And grass diversity also kind of was a different pattern where you had significantly less, somewhat less, and, and no change. But for all the others, you had less, no change, and more. So basic results, we had a 32% response rate. Even though we had about 509 responses, only 207 responded to the whole vignette survey experiment. So our sample size for, for the survey, for the factorial survey experiment, was 207. Uh, we had pretty good coverage across the whole area, east to west. And, and uh, if you noted before in that transit east to west, on the east side, you, has mo you had mostly cropland producers. And as you move west, you start getting more into that integrated crop and livestock and, and more livestock towards the west. So we were trying to target that whole range of, of variability in, in terms of, of management and, and landowner types. Uh, most of the of our respondents were full-time pr uh, producers or uh, uh, agricultural producers. 
and a lot of a lot of their income came from from their operations and a lot of like most of the uses were concentrated in livestock crops and then crop and livestock so our conceptual framework for the models that we did uh, were we had the seven ecosystem services and we changed those the, the levels of those ecosystem services uh, based on those vignettes to rate acceptability of invasive grass. And then that acceptability would uh, lead towards management intentions for those invasive grasses. So not surprisingly, a mixed models uh, approach kind of found that the level as level of acceptability uh, changed, we, it explained a lot of the variance in management intentions. So in other words, it, uh, the more unacceptable a grass was found, the more uh, intentions to reduce or manage that grass. Makes a lot of sense, pretty straightforward. I would, I would have expected this anyway, but it's good to see that, that it does follow what we had predicted in, in our, our conceptual framework. Then we look at uh, the acceptability of all ecosystem services and they were, and, and we found that the significant uh, a correlation between that acceptability and those ecosystem services. And, uh, and we, we saw that if uh, invasive grass came in and did not affect an operation, did not affect the status quo, and, and you did not see any changes in any of the other uh, ecosystem services, it would be found as slightly acceptable. So we use that as a baseline uh, where it's slightly acceptable. And so, and once we had that baseline, what we did was look at each one of the ecosystem services and, and the vignettes and kind of how tweaking each one of those ecosystem services would change that acceptability. So for the one on top here, we see that if, if these seven ecosystem services are maximized. Like we're seeing the best that we could see after this grass invades and we're actually seeing increases in ecosystem services, it was found to be slightly acceptable. But if that invasive grass comes in and it reduces all ecosystem services, it was found extremely unacceptable. So there's kind of a, it's not very symmetric there in terms of, of whether the, the max benefits versus MAC losses. And, and kind of this, this led us to, to come up with, with the idea that, that a lot of the management that's happening is more reactive than proactive. So landowners are reacting to those losses more than to gains. So once they see that ecosystem services on their land are being greatly affected, they are more likely to actually change versus thinking ahead and trying to manage ahead of time. And as we saw with with cami stock, if you wait till it's fully invaded, it, you might not see the results you want to see with those once you start applying those management treatments. And when we when we look at, at whether it benefits forage, if if you if the invasive grass that comes in produces some uh, forage that will keep a the full length of your grazing season in terms of the C three kind of. Uh, early in the season and then having some forage later in the season, it was found to be just slightly more acceptable than the baseline. If it hurts forage, uh, then it was unacceptable. If it benefits forage, hurts birds and pollinators, if it was a little less acceptable than the baseline. And if it benefits forage, hurts everything else, uh, fairly unacceptable. And then we plot Kentucky, uh, Kentucky bluegrass and, and how it has changed different ecosystem services. And we found that it was found to be fairly unacceptable uh, compared to that baseline. And then we look at that graph I showed earlier and kind of plot where, where those levels of Kentucky bluegrass fall within that acceptability and, uh, and willingness to manage kind of graph come out. And you see that at maximum loss, maximum loss here of Kentucky bluegrass, there is a, definitely a willingness to control or reduce it. But when you move down to moderate, this F here, it, it's kind of neutral, a little bit below neutral, so not that much willingness to reduce or control it. But at early stages, this G, it, it, it's 
towards the acceptable side of neutral. So there's not that much willingness to to manage it. And that that to me has a kind of important implications in terms of the research that we do and how we kind of get that on the ground. So people are not really, or, or our, our respondents are not uh, really uh, keying into those uh, to those increases in bluegrass. They're, they're, they're kind of status, like just, it, it provides forage and it, it, it produce, it has some, ecosystem benefits for them in terms of forage production. So it's it's not seen as totally negative. But then again, once you start getting that full invasion of Kentucky bluegrass, where all you have is bluegrass and you get hit by one of those warmer, drier spells and all you have is a C3 grass, then that's when when people start realizing, oh, might be too late. I might, I might have too much Kentucky bluegrass. So being proactive, really important, and kind of promoting that proactivity and that and kind of the that early intervention is really important. So in conclusion, ecosystem services are useful to understand the acceptability and management intentions of Kentucky bluegrass. So those seven ecosystem services that we picked were important in explaining this. And we picked those seven based on theory and, and interviews that Kyandra did with many of you here. So thank you very much for that. So that those ecosystem services came out as, as kind of the most salient in terms of those interviews and the ones that landowners would respond to. Uh, again, North Dakota landowners who responded to our survey appear to be uh, loss averse. They're more sensitive to those reductions in ecosystem services than to gains. And at early stages of invasion, Kentucky bluegrass was found to be acceptable and landowners had no management intentions to control it. So again, thinking forward, we know that Kentucky bluegrass is gonna keep invading, gonna keep taking over. So if we don't do something about it early, we might be in trouble. So acting early, being proactive is important and pushing that is important too. With that, I'll take any questions.